This is the second video in the three-part video series exploring the origins and problems with the claim that Gustav Mahler obtained a copy of Ives' Third Symphony and perhaps planned to premiere it. In the first video, we introduced the key players and the one and only quote by Ives that Mahler had seen the score and had been interested in it. In this video, we'll focus on Henry and Sidney Cowell, who were the first to put the more sensational form of the story in print. Let's begin by revisiting what Ives did say about his Third Symphony and Mahler. Quote, When this, the Third Symphony, was being copied in, I think, Tam's office, Gustav Mahler saw it and asked to have a copy. He was quite interested in it. Unquote. The Cowles surely read this, although they don't quote it in their book. Instead, they quote another unrelated memo and tie Mahler to it through careful editing that distorts Ives' words. To understand what the Cowles did, we'll first examine the unrelated memo, not as they present it, but as Kirkpatrick presents it in its original form. Then we'll look at the Cowles version and we'll contrast the two. Here's the original form of the unrelated memo. Quote, During the 20 years ending in 1919, only one conductor had seen any of my music. One, in 1910, did try over a part of the first symphony, which was completed in college, 1898. In the 10 years ending in 1929, two other conductors saw one score and the same score of mine. Mr. Schmitz asked me to send the three places in New England to Monteau when he was with the Boston Symphony, and Mr. Eugene Goosens played one movement of the Fourth Symphony in 1927. In other words, in this 30-year period, only four conductors, as far as I know, have seen any score of mine. Nicholas Slonimsky in 1929 saw the score three places in New England. Unquote. So, in his roundabout way, Ives identifies four conductors who saw his music from 1899 through 1929. Ives states that in the 20 years ending in 1919, only one conductor had seen his music, and the work in question was the First Symphony. Elsewhere in the memos, we learn that the conductor was Walter Damrosch. Ives then explains that in the 10 years ending in 1929, two conductors, Monteau and Slonemski, saw the score of three places in New England, and Goosens conducted part of the Fourth Symphony. Ives then tallies up the number of conductors who'd seen his music from 1899 through 1929 as four, naming three of them, Monteau, Slonemski, and Goosens, and leaving unnamed the conductor who rehearsed his first symphony, Damrosch. But notice that Mahler isn't in the mix. Now let's examine how this quote appears in the Cowles book and how the Cowles reworded it. Quote, During the 20 years ending 1919, only one conductor had seen any of my music. One, in 1910, did try over a part of a first symphony, which I completed in college in 1898. In the 30 years ending in 1929, two other conductors saw one score and the same score of mine. And another, Mr. Eugene Goosens, played one movement of the Fourth Symphony in 1927, unquote. This is shorter than the actual memo, and it's curiously reworded. First, the Cowles omit the names of the other conductors found in the full quote, Monteau and Slonemski. Then, before Ives' statement about those conductors, the Cowles combine the phrase 10 years ending in 1929 with the phrase in this 30-year period to produce the equivocal expression in the 30 years ending in 1929. This clever edit expands the time period for the unnamed conductors, unnamed, that is, in the Cowles' reduction of the memo, and allows them to make the following claim in a footnote. Quote, One of these was Gustav Mahler, who told Ives he would play the Third Symphony in Europe. But Mahler died before this intention could be carried out, and this score, too, was lost. Unquote. So, here, they identify Mahler as one of the conductors. But to do so, the Cowles have played fast and loose with the editing of Ives' actual text. Let's look again. In the original memo, Ives locates the two conductors between the years 1919 and 1929, introducing them with the phrase, in the 10 years ending in 1929. Mahler couldn't be one of them, as Mahler died in 1911. But the Cowles borrow Ives' phrase, 30-year period from a section they cut from this memo and then use that phrase to introduce the two conductors. 
This falsely makes the period of the two conductors 1899 through 1929, which encompasses the final years of Mahler's life. Finally, they omit the names of the other conductors who were supplied in Ives' original text, Monteau and Slonimsky. So, when the Cowles put the Mahler story in print for the first time, they linked it to an inaccurate quote of Ives and magnified Ives' original claim. In other words, they wrapped it in falsehood. Why did they do this? Perhaps they recalled Ives' other memo that Mahler had seen the score and was interested in it, and so they wanted to reconcile that claim with this text. Now, doing that alone is disingenuous, but worse, they amplified Ives' actual claim by stating Mahler told Ives he would play the work in Europe. Did Ives tell them this in conversation? Perhaps, but it's moot. All we've got is what he wrote. At best, it appears that the Cowles were overly optimistic about the extent of Mahler's contact with and response to the Third Symphony. They clearly distorted Ives' text to allow them to make their claim, which is sensational, and sensationalism sells. Note here that they're unambiguous in their preface that, aside from access to the memos, Ives did not help them with the biography. In their introduction, they write, quote, This is in no sense an authorized biography. Mr. and Mrs. Ives have not been shown the manuscript, nor have they asked to see it, unquote. In other words, it was their own work, and in fact, Ives died four days after they completed it, without any review or approval from him. And remember, since the complete memos weren't published until 1972, the Cowles version of the Mahler story became the de facto version, seeping into popular and academic memory for 17 years and taking root. But shrewd readers of the complete memos may discover another wrinkle to consider in the memo about the number of conductors. Ives has either deliberately omitted or forgotten about two other scores seen during that period by additional conductors not named in this memo, but explicitly named in another memo. To wit, elsewhere in the memos, on page 87, Ives describes showing the score of the Second Symphony in 1910 or 11 to Edgar Stowell, violinist and director of the Music Settlement School Orchestra, who Ives says programmed and performed the introduction from the Second Symphony at a school concert. Also, on page 102 through 103, Ives describes a read-through of Decoration Day by the National Symphony Orchestra in March 1920, conducted by Paul Eisler, an anecdote famous for its description of a solitary back-section violinist who was the only player who did not get lost every time the orchestra fell apart attempting the music. Last but not least, on the number of conductors memo itself, Ives forgets that Goosens conducted not one, as he claims, but two movements of the Fourth Symphony in 1927, an event that had taken place about four years before he began writing the memos. And Ives himself had copied the Celesta part for that performance and had attended the concert, so he would have known. What to say about all this? Ives's memory seems to come and go. Not only does he forget about Mahler when he wrote the number of conductors memo, but he also forgot about Eisler and Stowell and how many movements were played at the partial premiere of the Fourth Symphony. Now that we've covered the question of the cow's veracity, we'll see in the next video what Kirkpatrick did when he took the torch from them.